Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Yurit Erika Mayor, the country representative for EuroXS Japan. I would like to welcome you to the EuroXS Me fourth lab. And our two presenters for today are Adriana Milodinovic and Janusz Nedeshi. In this series, we actually host researchers at various stages in their career. And today's presentation is going to go to Janusz, who is the assistant professor at the Division of Biomedical Engineering for Health and Welfare at the Graduate School of Biomedical Engineering at Tohoku University. He's going to talk about the effects of sensory manipulations on motor control and learning, and that's from the perception to action specifications. So here we go, Janusz, the floor is yours. Let me just give you the screen. Yes, please go ahead. All right. Thank you very much for your kind introduction, Yuri, and also thanks for inviting me today. Um, welcome, everyone. Thanks for joining today's webinar. Uh, my name is Janos Nijashi. I received my PhD in medicine from Tohoku University, and my main interest is around motor control and learning. Um, when we talk about motor control and learning, first we need to start with the brain. I'm sure most of you know that our experiences about the bird are the mass of processed information within this fascinating organ. However, don't forget that the brain is locked inside the large chamber. What we see, feel, and sense depends on the best guess of the brain of what's going on out there in the world. Therefore, these self-related predictions are critically based on the sensory information coming from the environment. During perception, our brain combines these electrical impulses and based on previous experiences, expectations, or even beliefs, it tries to make the best guess of what caused those signals. Well, this also means that your brain can be easily tricked. If I wanted to make it simple, I would say that a part of our brain, which is called the motor cortex, is dedicated to control our movements. It sends down signals to the muscles, which in turn will contract, creating movements. With practice, we are able to store them in some libraries, and then when we would like to do the same movement again, we just need to run this particular script. Well, a bit more complicated procedure is going on. Performing and learning a movement requires the simultaneous contribution of three main systems. The motor systems are responsible for motor planning and control. The cognitive systems, such as memory and motivation, are involved during practicing motor skill. And for today, most importantly, the information from the sensory systems is fundamental for motor control and learning. This sensory information can be categorized in the following way. Probably a whole day wouldn't be enough to discuss all of them. Therefore, today, I would like to give you a brief summary of how visual and somatosensory modalities can contribute to motor control and learning. All right. First of all, I need to mention a great experiment in the field of neurosciences. This is a very popular one, so some of you in the audience might be familiar with this particular study. For this experiment, you only need a rubber arm, which is placed in front of the subject, and a standing visual partition that hides the subject's real arm. The subject is instructed to look at the rubber arm, while the experimenter strokes both the rubber hand and the subject's hidden hand simultaneously using two small paintbrushes. The researchers apply different conditions, and based on the completed questionnaires, their results indicated that most of the subjects experienced an illusion in which they felt that the rubber hand is part of their body, indicating a three-way interaction between vision, touch, and perception. This fascinating finding is used in stroke rehabilitation in the form of mirror therapy. For this, you only need a mirror between the limbs, which creates a reflection of the unaffected arm or leg in place of the affected limb. Therefore, when the unaffected limb is moved, the mirror image tricks our brain into thinking that the affected limb is moving. This vision-based rehabilitation technique has beneficial effects not only on motor impairments, 
but also on sensations and pain after stroke. The contribution of vision to motor control and learning is fundamental not only for stroke patients, but also for athletes. Actually, for all of us, visual information has a significant contribution to balance control. However, have you ever tried to perform a squat with eyes closed? You wouldn't guess, but athletes appear to be more stable when they rely more on proprioception for balancing. Therefore, eyes closed training can help athletes to adopt proprioceptive strategies, which in turn will lead to improve balance control and performance. Besides, keeping your eyes closed will allow you to perform another successful method to improve your sports performance. Visualization allows us to perform and experience motor actions in the mind without actually performing them. It can be used in many areas, including the training of athletes, training of surgical skills, or even as a part of rehabilitation after stroke. Motor imaginary has the potential not only to maintain already acquired skills, but also to facilitate motor learning, which is pretty cool, right? Besides vision, somatosensation sensation is an other important input that significantly contributes to motor control and learning. Today, I'm going to introduce you to the basics of how compression induces changes in proprioceptive motor control and how peripheral somatosensory electrical stimulation facilitates motor skill acquisition. The effects of compression on proprioception is a widely investigated area in both sports sciences and rehabilitation. Most of these studies used compression garments or joint stabilizers to induce compression. I promise that I'm not going to bother you with too much underlying working mechanisms. The only thing I am asking you to understand is that we can find small organs uh, inside our tendons, which are called Golgi tendon organs. Compression excites them, which in turn will inhibit some motor neurons and excite others through crazy complicated connections. Most importantly, because Golgi tendon organs have a significant contribution to proprioception, consequently, compression has the potential to affect it. One way to determine proprioceptive function is by measuring joint position sense. Joint position sense is the perception of position and movement in the joint. In one of our previous studies, we found that compression on the thigh had no beneficial effects on knee proprioception, most probably due to the placement of the garment. Therefore, we aim to investigate whether the position of such a compression garment affects knee joint position sense. In line with the expectations, the position of the compression garment modified knee joint position sense, showing less absolute position errors when the garment was applied below the knee, and less variable errors when the garment was applied on the knee joint. These results help us better understand how the application of compression garments may support athletic activities by decreasing the risk of musculoskeletal injuries. Yes, besides compression, some of the sensory electrical stimulation seems to have both direct and cross effects on motor performance in healthy individuals or in those who suffer from motor dysfunction. Nevertheless, studies were different in terms of experimental modalities. For example, the stimulation has different effects if it is delivered before, before during, or after the motor skill practice. Besides this temporal priming, spatial priming may also affect the results so that the stimulation may have different effects if it is delivered on the practicing or the non-practicing arms peripheral nerves. In our previous studies, we targeted healthy participants. The results of our first study indicated that both right hand motor practice and right hand stimulation alone can produce significant development in motor learning, not only on the practicing hand, but also on the non practicing hand. This phenomenon, by the way, is called interim transfer or cross education. However, as you can see, uh, the combination of uh, these two 
didn't uh, uh, resulted in further uh, development. Sorry. Therefore, in our next study, we aim to determine whether applying somatosense related growth stimulation on the non trained left arm's peripheral nerve would spatially prime the corresponding circuits during right hand model training. However, no additional effects were found. Nevertheless, it is interesting to see that peripheral somatosensory related growth stimulation as a form of somatosensory input has the potential to improve motor learning, even in case of healthy subjects, providing a useful rehabilitation practice for patients with motor dysfunction. All right. We have discussed how visual and somatosensory manipulations can contribute to motor control and learning, and therefore how they can be used in stroke rehabilitation or even in sports practice. However, understanding the changes in motor control and learning is fundamental for all of us because there is something which needs to be faced by everyone, and this is aging. With aging, it is getting more difficult to maintain our balance, to control our movements, or even to learn a new motor skill or a story of my life. Aging affects the optics of the eye, the visual cortical areas, and also the visual motor pathways, each contributing to limited visual processing. Besides vision, proprioception is also altered by age, which is associated with defects in both the peripheral and central levels, including sensory information processes and the loss of neurons and receptors. Finally, we can list several age-related changes in the brain, which lead to a decline in cognitive function. For example, there is a decrease in primitive processing speed and working memory, due to the degradations and lower activation of most of the cortical and subcortical areas and circuits. Interestingly, in contrast with these, the activity of the hippocampus and striatum increases, most probably to serve compensatory function in order to maintain similar levels of motor performance. Altogether, these changes will contribute to the age-related deficits in the neuromuscular control of the limbs and the acquisition of motor skills. Quickly, let me share some of our age-related studies with you. In this particular study, young and old subjects were asked to stand still with or without the support. While it is well known that motor cortex is involved in standing control, our results indicated that its role becomes more prominent with an increase in age and task difficulty. In another study, we found that healthy aging produces age-specific modifications in knee proprioception, showing different target matching behavior between young and older subjects. All right, let's summarize. Today, I try to give you a brief summary of how visual information can treat the brain, which can be used in rehabilitation in the form of mirror training. We discussed how eyes closed training can help to improve your balance control, and that visualization has the potential not only to maintain previously acquired skills, but also to facilitate motor learning. We have also learned that today that some of the sensory input in the form of compression or electrical stimulation can support motor control and learning, not only in patients with neuromuscular disorders, but also in the healthy population. And finally, Although aging is associated with a significant decline in sensory and motor processing, never forget that bringing exercise or any kind of physical activity to your life will serve you beneficial effects not only today, but also will contribute to healthy aging, providing better quality of life by protecting your brain from many diseases and slowing down the degradation processes, which in turn will help to maintain your balance mental health and cognitive function to support motor control and learning even when your sensory inputs are declined. So the most important message for today, stay active and stay safe. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. 
I would like to encourage our attendees to submit their questions. You can actually see the questions panel in the system. So please type your questions into the panel and I can read them to Janos so he would be able to answer. Okay, um, there is a person who says, okay, one minute. <laughs> Great. So again, I would like to encourage our audience to type the questions in the questions panel. I really enjoyed your presentation, by the way. It's something entirely new to me. Thanks. Okay, so the first person says, uh, hello Janusz, very nice presentation. The experiment you described about the optical illusion at the beginning was very interesting. Thank you. Um, I guess it's not really a question, so... Um... It is not really, but thank you for your comment. Um, I wanted to make it as simple as I can, but the underlying mechanisms of mirror therapy and visualization is really, really interesting. So if you are interested, I would like to also encourage you to email me. You can see my email address here or connect me because, yeah, that's a pretty nice discussion on this field. Thank you. So, uh, again, it says, and I loved how you built the story about motor control and learning. What happens when you lose an arm? Oh, that's a fascinating question. Very nice. Um, I try to make it simple. So, the point is that our brain is able to adopt to the circumstances, not only structurally, but also functionally. So um, you know that maybe uh, we have like a cross control of our limbs, but this is not entirely true. We also have ipsilateral, so uh, on the same um, side, we also control our movements. And when you lose an arm, we have so-called mirror neurons, which are also responsible for mirror training, and visualization, um, these mirror neurons are activated in many parts of the brain, um, including the frontal, the parietal areas, also the premotor cortex, the occipital cortex, and they have like really, really difficult connections. And the point is that when you lose an arm, these mirror neurons are able to create new connections, and therefore, um, you may have also uh, the potential um do you know what is like the phantom limb feeling this is also because of that because your brain couldn't adopt entirely for that there are some studies in the field of sports sciences um in which they showed that uh actually this is a japanese research group in which they showed that uh, the brain was able to totally reconstruct uh to support um uh, involving other muscles into the movement so uh what is happening so to answer your question uh what is happening uh, if you lose an arm that you have a total structural and functional uh reorganization in your brain and it can be used uh also in therapy later on to handle um this loss uh but also in sports sciences uh you can adopt to this uh to these changes One more time, thank you. thank you very much. I tried to mute myself, so um, maybe the ambient noise would uh, dis And we got an answer. It says, I see, thank you. Okay. 
Okay, hi. It seems that we do not have any further questions. So we shall jump to our next presenter. Uh, thank you very much, Janusz, again for the presentation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, our next uh, presenter is Adriana Miladinovic. She's Hi. from the Graduate School of Human Relations, Department of Sociology, KU University. And she's going to talk about the influence of whiteness on social integration, the experience of highly skilled European workers in Japan. Okay. Let me just give you presenter rights. Mm -hmm. go okay i hope you can see my presentation right now uh yes you need full screen that's it perfect thank you okay so hello everyone my name is adriana miladinovic uh today i will talk a bit about my master's thesis that i did for the department of sociology at uh, ku university so as you can see, my topic uh, is the influence of whiteness on social integration uh, based on the experience of highly skilled European workers in Japan. So to give you a bit of a background of my research, so through the uh, overwhelming processes of uh, globalization, um, world communities have been experiencing a certain social transformation, which has resulted not only in an increase of the cross-border flows of finance and trade, but also ideas, symbols, and imagery. So in other words, culture. And all of this has been happening through an increased mobility of individuals, which has led to a cer certain diversification of uh, migration processes and categories of migrants that are in the focus of migration studies. So international migration in particular is influencing this change in societies because the immigrants who come to certain host communities they bring with them uh, new customs and a certain ethnic diversity which uh, has a tendency to disturb the foundations of ethnic uh, homogeneity in modern nation states so we can see a certain clash of local so the national myths that are enforcing the homogeneity uh, versus the global uh, which is something the immigrants bring with them from their own cultures so uh, as, you, as you probably know, the traditionally defined migrant is uh, somebody who is forced by the circumstance, uh, economic or otherwise sociocultural, to relocate. However, um, with the uh, mentioned mobility, increased mobility, um, certain individuals uh, have the choice to migrate. And this choice is made by the so-called lifestyle migrant. Um, lifestyle migrants are uh, conceived of as uh, highly skilled, highly educated, uh, cosmopolitans. So this is, uh, these are the individuals who have a certain curiosity about places, people, uh, cultures. Uh, they are open to other cultures and they are willing to not be tourists, but to, in a way, consume other cultures. But this right to consume others' cultures is um, actually given only to people from certain range of societies. So um, Milos Debnar in his uh, very popular book uh, speaks of, about exactly this. Uh, and he says that these societies are um, those of the global North countries. So the United States, Europe, Australia, et cetera. So, Within the lifestyle migrations, um, what was of interest to me was um, the white migrations. So the representative of the, these migrations are the white, uh, white Caucasian individuals who are deemed as free floating cosmopolitans. And in this non, um, I, I wanted to research how these migrants would handle integration in non-white majority contexts where they cannot be the ones who dictate the cultural narratives, um, as this is something that has been uh, the heritage of the colonial times, this Eurocentrism, the, the whiteness that makes these individuals be seen as privileged and, of course, um, of higher status. 
So in non-white majority contexts, these individuals are seen as guest workers. So it can be assumed that there is no integration. So the non-white majority context that I chose for my research was Japan out of two reasons. Uh, first is that it is a, still a country where it is claimed that there is no uh, immigration. The second reason is that the uh, national homogeneity, so ethnic uniformness, is still being enforced in this country. So the aim of my um, research was to research the possibility of uh, integration of white European highly skilled workers in the non-white majority community of Japan. I wanted to see if there is a connection between whiteness and integration, if there are any advantages or disadvantages to being white uh, for integration. Uh, my assumption was that uh, there would be a certain clash of cultures. So of course, from the first uh, moments of uh, contact between the European traders in the 16th century and the Japanese, um, the image of Europeans was that of um, cosmopolitans, of, of highly educated people who bring um, new knowledge, new theories. And um, of course, the Japanese uh, basically adopted the racial theories that the Westerners brought with them. So I assume that uh, even though this image is still prevalent in the contemporary Japanese society, um, Japan has made a uh, huge progress since those times and has even caught up to the west as it is told very often so um i assume that there would be a clash of these two cultures wherein the europeans would be relegated to the position of the cultural other um of course this whiteness will give them privilege uh but i uh did not assume that it would give them privilege and in integration uh quite the opposite I assumed that they would be relegated to the sidelines of the society, so there would be a low degree of integration, and this would cause them to create certain cosmopolitan ghettos where they could renegotiate their white identities. So to tell you more about race and whiteness in Japan, um, first of all, the definition of race that I use, it was given by Lopez, it is a vast group of people loosely bound together by historically contingent, socially significant elements of their morphology and or ancestry. However, race in Japan, uh, as Yuko Kawai says in her research, has been directly adopted from the Western uh, theories of race. And uh, because of that, there are two concepts developed in Japan. Uh, the first concept is Jinshu, which is the direct translation of the word race. And in this uh, view, uh, Japan was racially a part of Asia, uh, as viewed by the Western civilizations. The second concept is Minzoku. Minzoku is used to self-represent the Japanese, and it distinguishes them from other peoples in Asia, as well as uh, other Western uh, civilizations, creating a unique Japanese race, which is an idea that is still being enforced through uh, Nihon Jinron narratives. Nihon Jinron is the theories of Japaneseness, uh, which are still being uh, very prevalent in Japan. So we can see that there is a reinterpretation of whiteness in the Japanese context. Um, the the image of white Europeans in Japan um, has gone through the first uh, the first moments from the first historical ties with the traders where. They brought new knowledge. Then through the Meiji period where Oyatoi Kaikokujin, foreigners for hire, came from Europe uh, to bring specialized knowledge in different fields and help Japan modernize. So they, they are still seen as the exact same cultural elite, cultural role models. But since Japan has made a lot of progress, um, I believe that they're now seen also as simply cultural others not exactly the apex of the racial hierarchy. So to uh, speak a bit about migration and integration in Japan, first of all, it is important to give the definition of a highly skilled migrant. Um, according to the government of Japan, uh, these individuals engage in advanced academic research activities, specialized technical activities, and business management activities. And this definition has been basically popular since 
the establishment of the highly skilled foreign professional visa in 2012. Um, uh, this is a point-based system uh, according to which highly skilled professionals are given a chance to uh, get to permanent residency more quickly, um, which is supposed to signal a, a welcoming stance of uh, the Japanese community towards them. Uh, as for the Europeans in Japan, in 2019, um, the data that I have is that there were around 85,000 Europeans uh, living long term in Japan, and only uh, 18,000 approximately were highly skilled workers. And here I include the specialist in humanities or international services visa, because according to the older um, point of view, it, it was also a highly skilled visa. Um, integration strategies in Japan have changed since the, uh, since the time of the Empire of Japan. At that time, it was assimilation, so complete loss of one's uh, national values and, and customs and culture, and uh, basically assimilation into the Japanese culture. Right now, it is um, official stance of the Japanese government is integration, that is multicultural coexistence in Japanese tabunka kyose, which uh, was um, basically explained by the Ministry of Internal Affairs as uh, people of different nationalities or ethnicities recognizing each other's cultural difference and living together in local societies while attempting to build an equal relationship. However, of course, there is a discrepancy between official state policies and reality wherein volunteers and grassroots movements are the ones who deal with migrants uh, directly and they are the ones helping them integrate at any level. So these are the problems as well and challenges of integration wherein this idea of homogeneity that I mentioned earlier uh, distinguishes them from the Japanese, um, especially because Europeans are phenotypically different. So they are recognized as uh, foreigners. There's also linguistic barriers and um, in Oishi Nana's article, uh, she mentions uh, a lack of work and private life balance education as, for the children as well. So um, in my research, I gathered data through one-on-one -on -one semi-structured interviews with 16 European citizens who have been living in Japan for longer than one year. And um, you can see the data here. Um, most of them are between 24 and 36 years old, except for one who is 50. Most of them uh, did not have high Japanese language skills, but all of them um, finished at least, that, uh, they received a bachelor's degree at least. Um, so the data that I gathered was basically, um, could be divided into two different uh, spheres. One is integration into professional environment, where uh, almost all of my interviews uh, mentioned how they had a smooth interview process, uh, which was done usually online, usually in English and from their own countries. They, held, they had help with relocating every benefit that they expected they received, um, the position that they applied for, they also could acquire. Um, but this was uh, mostly coming from those who are working in international companies in Japan. Um, those working in exclusively Japanese companies mention how they feel isolated. They're seen as celebrities in their departments because they're usually the only foreigner. So they're the token foreigner, the symbolic foreigner who just represents difference and diversity. Um, and the third category of my interviews were the English teachers who were basically given the freedom and they were even required to stay foreign so they could expose their students to diversity. For any kind of career advancement, all of my interviews mentioned that they need to learn Japanese. So English was enough for the, for the first time, but uh, Japanese was necessary for any kind of advancement. Integration into the everyday community was quite different. So if at work they could use their skills in, in the social community, uh, they mentioned how they did not feel like a full citizens of Japan, they were given a lot of freedom and much less responsibility 
or at least that's how they felt. So they were, they even accepted that the Japanese would consider them different and foreign at all times. So they uh, used the Gaijin card, as they mentioned, uh, me mentioned um, anytime they make a cultural blunder and the Japanese would forgive them. They also mentioned that it was impossible to make meaning meaningful friendships. Um, so they stayed within their international friend groups. Uh, they were treated like celebrities on the street. You can see they were asked to have their photos taken, um, expected to speak English, even though some of them couldn't speak English. Um, and one, uh, one interesting thing was that they were, they felt like they were allowed to experience Japanese culture, but not become a part of it. So they could not integrate, they, they could just experience. So um, two of my hypotheses were um, confirmed. Whiteness what is a privilege. They have advantages during interviews. They're considered celebrities in the work environment as well as outside. They're forgiven for cultural mistakes. They're given more freedom, but this uh, means that they cannot integrate. They do not become Japanese, a part of Japanese culture or Japanese community. They are perpetually seen as foreigners. Uh, there is also a cultural clash uh, in relation with this. Um, the Europeans are favored in the media, um, seeing as they're the white cultural role models, but um, they're also welcome as guest workers as they're perceived as cosmopolitan, so highly skilled, highly educated, but they're expected to leave. Uh, so none of their coworkers help them integrate. Um, as for the creation of cosmopolitan ghettos, this is the one hypothesis I could not confirm because most of my interviews simply formed small international private circles with uh, minimal Japanese influence within. So it was simply friends from Western um, countries. So to conclude, uh, whiteness is a privilege for highly skilled Europeans, but it's an obstacle in integration. And seeing as they accept being seen, my interviews except being seen as foreigners, they didn't even show interest in integrating completely. Um, they felt like they were offered an experience of the Japanese culture, but not to become a part of it. And the language barrier was too great for most of them to fully participate or even attempt to fully participate. So for further research, I would like to increase my sample to include white Europeans who have families with them because interestingly, all of my interviewees were single. Um, I would like to include those with higher Japanese skill and those who do not belong to the highly skilled category because I believe their integration would be completely different. Um, yes, so these are the references just in case anybody is interested, but that is all from me. Thank you for listening. I'm looking forward to all the questions you might have. Thank you very much. Very interesting presentation. Thank you so much. You. And again, the questions. Keep them coming, dear attendees. We are very much looking forward to your questions. We, we are actually. Yes, that's why I said it in plural. <laughs> I am hoping somebody can give me an idea how to continue with my research. Yes, at the moment, I do not see any questions coming. Yeah, again, still no questions, but let's give our audience a few more minutes just in case. Of course in case anybody has any questions that they come up with later they can always contact me i check my email regularly okay well it seems we have one question okay so the integration of Europeans into Japanese society 
fails in most cases? What can be done to improve it? Can anything be done from the European side to improve it? And uh, then from, we will have one more question after that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. From the European side, of course, there is a lot we can do to improve our own integration there. Um, first of all, it is always important to learn the language. So all of those uh, Europeans who come to Japan expecting to get by only with English are not attempting to integrate at all. Um, they're just using their Gaijin card. Um, another thing that we can do if we would like to integrate not just Europeans, just in general, is to learn about the culture, but also uh, try to kind of force ourselves into it um, because the Japanese do not seem very uh, welcoming to people who want to become a part of the culture, as my interviews experience. So they needed to actually push the boundaries. They had to step right into the culture and make it their own. But most of them did not want to do that because they felt very, well, there are different nationalities, but they all mentioned how their own nationality was strengthened by being in Japan. So, of course, this is not something that is good for integration. Yes, we actually have um, a comment. Mm -hmm. It said, um, okay, my experience, uh, I was uh, um, enforced to assimilate at both work, place and social life. Both failed and I was marginalized and isolated. Now I'm distant at work and living in my own bubble with Europeans in my social life. This is similar for at least 10 people I know. Yes. Um, Japanese population is diminishing and they will need more and more migrants. Do you think this will come with great clashes one day? Thank you. Mm -hmm. it, it, I think it's already kind of causing clashes just in, in the, within this idea that you have to assimilate to the Japanese culture. So there is no real integration here. If you want to be a part of the Japanese culture, you have to become Japanese. But of course, unless the Japanese side becomes more open to people who do not per se look and talk and behave exactly like the other Japanese that they're used to, there is no real combination there. There's no real integration or even assimilation for that matter. Um, so I think that especially in this day and age, Japan needs to be more receptive to others, but it's not really happening, not, not yet. Oh. Okay, and uh, we have another question. How do the Japanese see Europeans um, and fail to integrate at some point? Failing over and over again is a huge waste of resources. I don't think I actually understand the question. Um, yeah. Um, so I'm not sure if you can answer that. It's... I, I I might understand what the, the this person meant. Um, of course, if we attempt to integrate and we fail over and over again, of course the Japanese side won't like that. It is really a waste of resource but exactly because it's a waste of resource not only Europeans but also the Japanese have to kind of make more effort so if we want to live in Japan it's not enough to just consume the culture as a tourist you have to be there you have to participate but also from the Japanese side um, it's not reasonable to just simply see a foreigner and expect them not to be able to integrate that's also not fair so there has to be openness and fairness on from both sides of course so being white doesn't mean that we're privileged and we have to do everything our way if we want to live in japan if we want to stay there permanently then this whiteness has to be deconstructed and it has to disappear absolutely yeah, i understand your point one last question um in my view, a similar thing can happen when Japanese try to integrate into Europe. Yes, that is 
that is completely true, especially because it's a white majority society where white privilege is prevalent. And I don't like to think this way myself, but I think that many people still feel like other races are inferior and do not deserve the same chance. I have people in my surroundings who feel this way, not just about Asians, but also about African Americans. So of course it can happen and it still happens. So the world needs to be more open and receptive. Just a bright message for the future. Yes, again, um, thank you very much. I have to apologize to uh, one of the attendees. He keeps raising his hand. And as I could see, he also tried to call. I'm afraid um, this is a this is not one of those platforms when I can um, give you access to our line. Uh, questions could be submitted uh, through the questions tab. So if you have any further questions, please send um, any of our presenters an email or to us at japan at eurocess.net. Thank you so much for today. That's all we've had time for. I'm afraid. Let's just um, yes. Let's just uh, say goodbye at this point. Thank you to both our presenters, and I would like to welcome you in our next presentations in the coming months. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks for joining.